Welcome to another Ozark Forces Oral History Interview, a project of Missouri State University Libraries and its Ozark Studies Institute Initiative. I'm Craig Amison with the University Libraries, and today's date is Wednesday, July 29th, 2020. Our special guest is Mr. Kelly Burke, a third generation forester who owns and operates Burke Timber in Marionville, Missouri, which is where this interview is taking place today. Thank you so much for Thank allowing you, me to be here to talk with you today and for participating in the project. Yes, sir. Just for the record, can you start off by telling us when and where you were born? I was born in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, 1965, March 8th. Okay. Um, you're a third generation forester. Um, then I assume it was your grandfather who got you interested in working with timber? Yes. And uh, uh, was that here or elsewhere? Or? Well, uh, uh, when I was, I was born, uh, they were waiting. They would went out to Pennsylvania to cut walnut, and uh, that market kind of dried up, and they were waiting on me to be born to move back to Missouri. So uh, that's how I ended, we ended up back in Van Buren, Missouri, which was where my grandpa and his family were from. And how old were you when you? Three days old when Three we come back to <laughs> Van Buren, Missouri. And wow. Fremont, Missouri is in that area there, Carter County. And so you're, um, tell us about your grandfather, if he's the one who sort of got, got, got the family into this, I assume. Yeah, uh, my grandfather was, uh, you know, he was, he was born in 1909, and, and uh, he was uh, just, all he knew was just poor and hard work, you know, and they, they used to make uh, ties with the broad axe mm -hmm. and hew them out by hand, and he said they'd, you know, make a, get out and make ties and carry them out on their shoulder and throw them on an old team and wagon, haul them in, and if you could stick a blade of grass in the end of them, the buyer would cull them, and they'd make 10 cents a piece for yeah, doing that. And so you had to be pretty good at it. That, that, that was hard work. <laughs> yeah. where, where did he start with that? Where? Well, and over in Carter County and, and, and uh, Shannon County, and he was, he was born over on the river at Paint Rock, on Current River over okay. there when there was a community over there. His, okay. His dad, actually, they have a uh, certificate where he was sworn, sworn in as a postmaster of Paint Rock. Really? <laughs> so what, what, in what, 1911. Gosh, he may have been the first one. <laughs> <laughs> he, went to, he went to the third grade, was as far uh, as the yeah. school he went. Yeah. The rest of the time was just work. Any idea about how these... Those uh, folks migrated into into the Ozarks. That's a story we just really don't know. We've done a lot of research into the genealogy part of it, and uh, uh, my grandpa's dad was was an older man whenever he was born, and died when he was pretty young, and he never spoke of his family. Uh -huh. uh, they best they could tell was they maybe had some kind of family feud and uh -huh. moved from they thought maybe from the northeast mm -hmm. and just come down there and never spoke of it again you know and this so uh, we've tried to research but you know in that time it, it wasn't a lot of records kept sure. you know and uh, uh, but, sure. uh, um, well he um did he acquire did your grandfather acquire some land uh, with timber yes uh you know he he was uh, uh mostly around in the uh, uh, fremont you know, area in the Van Buren area and, and uh, bought timber and land and uh, sawmilled and logged over there his whole life, you uh -huh. know. And, and then his kids, uh, he had, uh, they had seven children. They lost uh, uh, two when they were young to the fever up at uh, Midco Holler up, uh -huh. up over in that country. And then my dad and uncles were all in the sawmill business and, um, my uh, two aunts, they, uh, one of them lives in uh, Van Buren now, and the other one lives in Georgia. And, uh, but uh, so they, they, that's all we've ever, ever known. And my, I got cousins that's got mills. So there's, uh, my brother logs for me. He's got a logging company. And then cousin at Climax Springs that has a sawmill and logging. And then another cousin at Van Buren that still has a logging and Sawmill company. Well, so it's, it's in a, the DNA, <laughs> isn't it? It's, uh, we was born with the sawdust in our blood, I guess. <laughs> really? Yeah, that's what it sounds yeah. like. Well, so, so uh, what kind of knowledge uh, was passed down from your grandfather? I mean, did, 
Did you learn it more from your grandfather or from your father or from uncles or, or a combination? Or? My, my, my grandfather and, and my dad was in it too, and, but I was, well, me and my brother and sister were raised by our grandma and grandpa. Okay. And, uh, so we kind of knew, you know, we were just poor and that's what we had to do to survive, you know. Mm -hmm. And so even, um, you know, when, when we started living with them, I think I was three years old or mm -hmm. four. And uh, so every time we wasn't in school and on Saturdays, we worked. Yeah. And we went to the woods and we cut, we neither cut cordwood or we cut firewood or we were cutting, helping uncles cut logs or he was helping in the sawmill and, and uh, when I was, you know, 10, 12 years old, I was stacking slabs in the back of the sawmill and doing whatever I had to do when we wasn't in school. It was just a part of life. We didn't think nothing of it. It was just part of life. So, so you started very young. Oh, yeah. Uh, when yeah. you were in elementary school. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, me and my brother went out and made, with Grandpa, he'd cut and split uh, eight-foot fence posts, mm -hmm. and we had to bark them. We had ball peen hammers and knock the bark off of them uh -huh. while he cut them and split them and we'd do between 125 and 150 every Saturday. Yeah, that's, that's a lot of work. <laughs> yeah. Is your brother older or younger than you? He's older. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. He's four years older than okay. I am. Um, in, in, the, in the 19th and early 20th centuries, the most active timbering activity took place in southeast Missouri with Grand, Grandinville mm -hmm. and other mm -hmm. operations like yeah. that. When, when did the industry take off here in Southwest Missouri, do you know? Uh, it's it's been it's it's been around, but it's been real slow, mm -hmm. you know, in this part because it's uh, this is a lot of uh, uh, agriculture, grassland more mm -hmm. in this area. Uh, so o over in the in that southeast area, which is the Grandin Mill, and over in there, that's just uh, it's more just timber country because it's rougher, mm -hmm. you know, it's hillier and rougher and. Uh, so as you come west, the ground, the soil is a little better for crop and grass and cows and beef market. Mm -hmm. So, uh, it, but it's, you know, it's still here. It's, you know, it's just a little smaller, you know, uh, over in this area than it is over on the east side. Okay, not as much timber. Right, right. right. Okay. Uh, you know, you're, you cut on a, uh, might be on a 300 acre track of land and there's 40 acres of timber. And, you know, over in that country, a 40-acre track of timber is pretty small. You know, it's a lot of federal and state ground over there, which uh, Mark Twain Forest and, uh, and then the Missouri Department of Conservation has a lot of timber ground over in that area. Right. Are, are, are there differences between the two sections of the state in, in this industry in other other categories like types of trees and that sort of thing? Um, uh, are there little pines over there as opposed to... Yes, uh, as you go back uh, east, uh, probably from starting about Mountain Grove on the east, uh, uh, pine is a lot more dense over there. You have a lot more pine. We haven't had, we don't hardly have any pine in this particular area. Now, Cassville and south, you get back into pine, but pine is, uh, is, is pretty dominant over in there, but the oak over in that area is probably overall a little better quality than it is over in this country. Mm -hmm. I would say that uh, this country, it, it may be a little bigger in size, an average size, but it's not as, it's not uh, uh, quite the quality that, uh -huh. that over there has. This, this has a lot of mineral, it, mineral streaks, which, mm -hmm. you know, downgrades it a little bit. And uh, now I've heard a lot of stories around in this country about uh, this bigger timber you're sawing a, a good log and all of a sudden you find a rotten spot in the side of it like we're a knot. You know, you just it's just going along and it's perfect and you cut a board off and then there's a little rotten spot in the side. And some of the older guys around here will tell you that that's when they were clearing the ground for grass, a lot of them sprayed. And that overspray got over into some of the timber ground, the wind blew it and mm -hmm. if there was a something that that kind of hit that spot, you know, mm -hmm. and, and so now that's story, so I don't know if how much of that's true. You, uh -huh, you know, sure. I, I couldn't prove it by nobody. Yeah. <laughs> so you, you started working for your father at some point. When did mm -hmm. your father take over the operation? Uh, how old were you when he did that? Well, I just kind of, from my grandpa on, I, uh, my 
when I was uh, 18 uh, years old, uh, me and my brother bought our first skitter and started started our own little logging operation. And then when I was uh, all probably 21 to 23, me and my uncle partnered up and bought a sawmill. Mm -hmm. And uh, we, we sawmill and logged together for a while. And then um, and he retired and I kind of went on and, and uh, you know, been in and out of the sawmill. And I tried a few other things along the way when and uh, thought I'd try to get out of this rough business, but always go back to what you know, and and I enjoy it 95 percent of the time. <laughs> well, it, it's burnt timber. Mm -hmm. So, how long has it been burnt timber? Um, did your grandfather call it burnt timber? Or is... No, you know, back when he was sawmilling, they didn't call it anything. Uh -huh. They just yeah. Yeah, right. <laughs> it was Johnny Burke sawmill. You know, he just. Right. Uh, you know, everybody knew it as that, and uh, and uh, that's, you know, when I started was probably one of the first times it was ever really named, named something, yeah. yeah. And his name was Johnny, what was your father's name? Uh, Danny. Danny? Yeah. Okay. And, uh, and um, how long at this location? We have been here for 12 years okay. here at this location. And so just, just for the record, tell us what this location is. Uh, well, this is... Uh, uh, we have a Marionville address. We're uh, at 1589 Shiloh Church Road, and uh, we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. We're five miles from Clever and five miles from Marionville and mm -hmm. five miles from Crane and four miles from Hurley. So yeah. <laughs> we're kind of just in a little... How did, uh, um, how, did, how did you decide on this? Well, I, w I was just logging a little bit. When we moved up here, I'd sold a sawmill and logging operation in Van Buren. Mm -hmm and was trying to get out of it a little bit, come up here, and we had the uh, 08, 09 crash of the markets. And so I messed around in real estate a little bit for a few years and uh, kind of was logging a little bit. The ice storm come when that happened, and uh, some of the neighbors that uh, we was living in Billings at that time, outside of Billings, and uh, that ice storm come, and some of the neighbors knew I was logging a little bit and it knew it and so we started doing some of the cleanup and damage uh trees from the ice storm and that kind of got us back in it and uh things were a little rough around here markets weren't very good and uh i just uh some of this uh the local markets weren't treating people very fairly i didn't believe so uh, I just put in a, I told that boy, my oldest boy was helping me then, the other one was still in school, and I said, uh, you know, we're just not going to be cheated out of our, I said, I know what this stuff's worth and what it ought to be worth, and mm -hmm. I said, we're just going to, we're just going to get back in the sawmill a little bit, and I told him, I said, well, we'll just buy a few logs and saw a little bit, log a little if we have to, and, and uh, but I said, the main thing is, is when they bring logs in here, they're going to get paid for them. Mm -hmm. They're not going to wait on their money. We're going to give them what they bring us and pay for what you get and get what you pay for. Mm -hmm. And within six months, we were covered up in logs. So we, we went and we had an old hand ratchet mill. And, and uh, after we started getting all the logs in, I said, I think we need to upgrade. So we went down in uh, Tupelo, Mississippi and bought a, automatic mill really? and brought it up here and set it in and yeah and we we went along there for oh i don't know probably six years or so with that mill mm -hmm. and i told uh, both of my boys and my nephews also that uh, i said well i said i you know probably by the time i'm 60 i'm going to retire and you guys are going to have to take this over but uh, if you want to stay in it and plan on staying in it, I'll build one more mill, mm -hmm. one more. So we started putting this new mill in over a basement and, and put the uh, grade resaw in and grinder and stuff. And uh, so they've got four more years. So it sounds, like, <laughs> sounds like your sons are interested in, yes. uh, in continuing. What are their names? 
Uh, Adam Burke, Blake Burke, and my nephews are Kyle Burke and Curtis Burke. Okay. And, and they're, they're so, are they all working together? Yes, sir. Yeah. Well, yeah that that has to be a pretty good feeling. It is. It is. It's nice to see them all out there interested in something that's been in the family forever, you know. And well, sure. That they're interested in it and willing to kind of take over and run with it. You know? Yeah. You know, each each generation, I think you try to give them a step up. You know, you don't. I don't think that I should give it to them, but I think they should, as long as they're willing to work and go at it, then I give them a little boost, you sure, know, and, sure. and uh, help them out. So. Wonderful. You're a uh, certified master logger, yes, uh, one of only 21, I think, in the whole state. Yeah. Um, so I assume you work directly with landowners um, yeah. and, and, and perhaps contracted foresters? Yes. Is that correct? Yes. Um, I'm curious, are forest management plans frequently used? Yes. Um, the, Is that it, more so now than it used to be? Yeah, used? way more so mm -hmm. now. Uh, it, it used to just be, you know, how much for my timber and mm -hmm. cut whatever, bring me a dollar and... So our, our main focus is now when I go meet with the landowner, first thing is what are your objectives? Mm -hmm. You know, are you need, is it just money? Are you looking for wildlife? Mm -hmm. Is this going to be your, you know, place you're going to live at forever? And, and uh, so, you know, you kind of got to, you know, understand what they're thinking, you know, that they want to do. Sure. And, and then, and then kind of give them a plan of what you think should be done. And, and I've walked away from several, you know, that just wasn't ready, you know, just, it's too little, you need to wait. It's, I could cut and get some out of here, but it's just not ready. Mm -hmm. You know, you need to wait a few more years. And, uh, so I'm not afraid to tell them that they're, you know, if that's not the prescription, you know, just don't do it. Now, if you really want me to, I will, but you're going to turn it into fields. Let's don't waste it. But if you're going to keep it in timber and want something, you need to let it set, mm -hmm. you know, or, uh, the other way or you've let it go go too long mm -hmm. you know and there's a lot a lot happens that a lot of landowners don't understand about their timber and their trees is just because they're big doesn't mean they're good mm -hmm. and they've let them go too long and not not started a management program where they could rotate harvest you know cut some now 15 years cut some more they want to wait and then it's like there's nothing, you just got to cut it all. There's nothing left. If you, if you size cut it, there's still nothing left because the trees are too big and they're, they're already past maturity. They're going back toward the yeah, climax yeah, forest. Is that the yeah. kind of situation? There? So it's kind of started over. But mm -hmm. if you do the, the uneven age management is one of the best prescriptions. If you kind of start it early and catch it, which is you take, you take some of the mature trees and you're always leaving trees that, you know, you can come back and cut in 10 or 15 years, you know, and keep cutting, you know, and not, not just have one cut and done, you or know. rotation. Right, right. right. Mm -hmm. So. And is 15 years about what um, most people can expect, or it, does it, it depend it, on the species of trees? It, the species of trees is, mm -hmm. and the timber ground. You know, there's some ground that's never been cut and won't ever be cut. It just don't grow timber. It, mm -hmm. It'll have little short, stubby post oak and, and glady hillsides that, uh, uh have never had tree, you know, maybe has a few trees now, but that's it. I mean, mm -hmm. they're 100 years old and they're still 12 inches. You know, they just not, right. it's just not timber ground. And then right. you you go from the south facing slope to the north facing slope and a tree on the same age stuff will have three and four and five logs in it where the other side has two. And it just, that's just the change in the ground and the way the moisture hits it and you know, the, the side, the, the snow stays on the longest is always the best side. Uh-huh, yeah. It's always the best side. And well, are, do you draw up forest management plans for people? I, I do. I can. I can. Uh, I, if on a lot of jobs, if it's on some of those, I will try to refer them to a, a forester. Uh -huh. Neither have the conservation, you know, let them just don't just take my word for it. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, sure. I'm. I'm in it to make money. I'm, you know, I'm here for profit. So if you have any reservations about your timber, you know, and me just telling you, hey, this is the way you need to cut it, um, I'll tell them, you know, here's a forester, give them their name. You need to call them. Uh, you know, neither a private forester, if you don't want to deal with the uh, conservation department, 
you know, and then let them tell you, you know, what the best prescription is. And uh, so, give us an overview of the operation of burnt timber from the tree growing in the forest to the finished product. I, you know, and I know, I know that's kind of uh -huh. that's a, that's a big field, but you know, are, are you involved with cruising timber, for instance? Are are you in it from the very beginning? Yes, sir. That's that's uh, I'm from start to finish. You know, I. Uh, I meet with the landowners, walk the timber, give them a idea, and and try to understand what they're looking for, and then and then once they kind of, I kind of feel like I understand the direction they're wanting to go, then I'll go back and and cruise the timber then and give them a, a dollar value on what's there, you know, and uh, if they accept that and according to that, then uh, I have a Con, which my brother has the the logging crew mm -hmm. and so then I'll take him over there and say okay this is what we're cutting here's the contract these are the conditions that we're cutting this and then I let him he does kind of handles the logging end of it for me and uh, and I'll go out you know periodically and kind of see that they're you know getting along and you know that everything is being you know cut like it's supposed to and and uh and uh, I can, that's one thing about your brother, I can trust him. He's going to do exactly, because it's his name out there too. So. Right, right. <laughs> but, uh, so, and then once it goes from there, and I uh, I have a contract trucker that actually hauls the logs. So I got out of the log hauling business a few years ago. I, okay. Hard to find drivers. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I had a guy that had his own truck, and he wanted to do the hauling for me. So we just come to an agreement on I pay him so much a ton to haul, and he he keeps the logs hauled. And then he brings them in. We scale them in, weigh them in, and then we scale them out. And uh, and then uh, they go through the go into the mill. We try to keep we're a little low on logs at the at right now at the time, but we still got a week or so left on the yard. Things are kind of slow with markets and the COVID. Uh, it's kind of got things slowed up a little bit, but. Uh, we're still sawing every day, mm -hmm. and uh, so once they uh, get on the yard, we usually will we'll date the rows and saw them in the order they came in, you know, because mm -hmm. we've, we've had as much as a million feet on the yard at one time, so uh, we try to keep everything in rotation so that uh, stuff is not more than, you know, three or four weeks old or, you know, depending on how many we have. And, uh, then it goes into the sawmill and uh, the circle saw, what we call the sawmill, the circle saw goes in and they, uh, anything that's, uh, that will uh, square up a 14 inch by 14 inch will then go over to what we call the grade resaw. Mm -hmm. And uh, you go from a, a, a quarter inch kerf on the circle saw over to the band resaw and you're going from a quarter of an inch curve to a sixteenth of an inch curve. Mm -hmm. So ever, you know, on a 14 by 14, instead of sawdust, you can get a board, mm -hmm. you know. So then it, it goes through there, and there, the sawyers are looking to get flooring or cabinet-grade lumber off the sides, and the main product is trying to get a railroad tie out of the heart. Right. And... Uh, and it, it just goes down the line, and, and uh, then I have stackers and graders in the back that actually decide we have to separate red and white, and, uh, and hickory all has to be separated into different stacks, and they decide whether it's good enough to go into the grading flooring or if they cut it and it, it's not good enough. Most of that, neither low grade will sell for barn lumber, uh, people that build horse corrals or, you know, just a, you know, piece that doesn't have to be perfect but they can nail it up for a board a barn piece or something and and if it's not good for that it goes in and goes through the grinder and then it's uh landscape and mulch is what comes out of there and then the sawdust it comes down and goes through the conveyor we sell it to uh neither pellet mills most of it or uh, go to kingsford to make charcoal mm -hmm. so Long ways from where it used to be. Every nothing is wasted. Everything yeah. stays on concrete and is hauled and 
sold and used. Yeah, every scrap. Every yeah. scrap. So, so your, your main products are railroad ties, flooring and cabinetry, um, mulch and sawdust. Yeah, and a low grade product which goes to, for pallets. Okay, we build pallet. pallet. Yeah. We cut. We also cut cut stock, make pallets. You know, out of, we don't build the pallets, but we sell the lumber to build them with. Mm -hmm. and, you know. and out of out of those products, uh, from just from the financial standpoint, are the railroad ties the most? Yes. Bring you the most money. The, right now, uh, the way the market stands, yes, the okay. railroad ties are. The, the lumber market has is, is fell pretty hard uh, with, uh, we had, you know, with the trade wars um, early or late fall and early uh, winter January, we had started to see a, a increase. Uh, things had started to pick back up and go pretty good. Just about the time that happened, then COVID hit. Yeah. And then we had the shutdown where you couldn't, of course, most of the flooring is probably two thirds of the flooring is exported, so that that really killed everything. We actually for three weeks, uh, March, April, we couldn't sell a board. Mm -hmm. They had everything shut down, and uh, so the time market has held steady and has kept everything together. The pallet market fell off too, but now it's started to pick back up because sure. people are starting to move and. Sure. Things are going. The flooring is moving some. Mm -hmm. uh, we, we're not on quotas anymore. So, but uh, I, that's what I keep telling everybody. We can give as much of it away as we want. Yeah. Well, so. since, since you're talking about it, I was going to ask that later. But since you're talking about it now, I was going to ask you what effect COVID had had on your business. Any, any other impacts? It's been pretty hard on everything. Uh, you know, we, we have, we've been really fortunate None of our employees have gotten sick. We've took extra precautions to, you know, break rooms, keep them separated, give, mm -hmm. you know, um, and, if, you know, just tell them if you feel sick, stay at home. Yeah. Uh, you know, right. if you feel it. So we've been real fortunate in that. But we, we've not laid anybody off. Everybody stayed working. Uh, we, we were running at 50%, 60%. Yeah. Uh, we done a lot of cleaning and painting and maintenance <laughs> for several weeks there just to just to try to keep everybody busy and incomes coming in. So, so I was thinking about that for a lot mm -hmm. of businesses. There's probably no deferred yeah. now. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> well, uh, what about from the supply side? Were you having difficult getting supplies uh, for machinery, equipment, whatever? We are, we have been more in the last probably three or four weeks than we had when it first started. Mm -hmm. uh, what stuff we could order and have it in two days, just easy. Now it's taken three and four weeks. Really? It, ev everything is back ordered. I don't know if they, of course, I guess their factory shut down. They kept taking orders and now they're having to double production to try to catch sure. up and they're still not working at full capacity. Right. So, yeah, we, 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 we've seen a lot of that. Our are uh, one of the big ones is we we've been trying to order saw teeth which are little uh, carbide bits to go in our circle saw uh -huh. and they're having trouble getting carbide so they're limited on how many you can buy and wow. we usually buy four or five hundred at a time and they won't let you have more than a hundred at a time mm -hmm. and it takes 52 of them to put them in the saw so uh, we're we're kind of scrambling right now to make sure we have supplies you know and well, um, you had talked about um, red and white and, and, mm -hmm. and so forth. Um, that was a question I had. What, what are the most marketable species of trees in this area of the state that are the most desirable? I would say in, in this area particularly, uh, walnut is probably the most desirable. It's the most valuable. Mm -hmm. uh, little... Uh, little different ball game you know as far as what we do um, our walnut we sell in a log uh, we don't even saw the walnut so if we cut some walnut we just resell to the veneer buyers and the, those buyers because you it, it's one of them things you neither got to be all in it all in it uh -huh. or stay out of it you can't just dabble in it you have to be in it and so we we just 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 worked better for us to just what walnut we cut um, to just resell. Uh, 
we don't get out and actively uh, search for walnut trees. Mm -hmm. We will cut them and give the landowner the full value of it according to what way we have to sell it. Mm -hmm. But uh, oak is our specialty. So mm -hmm. on the oak side, the next one would probably be white oak, which um, you, you're looking for a, a good white oak, which is stave quality, which is what they make whiskey barrels out of. Mm -hmm. And that's probably, the, but it's, that's usually just the first eight or 10 foot, 80% of the time it's the first eight or 10 foot of that tree. The other part of it goes into our mill, which would be flooring and tie grade. So they just want the best of the best on the white oak. So the ties are mostly made of oak? Oak, okay. yep, yep. 100% oak in okay. our mill, yep. Uh, hickory. Is that, is that uniform across the, yes. the, the industry? Yeah. Uh, yes. Railroad ties are typically made of oak? Yes, every now and then they'll get a special order for some pine, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, we haven't probably cut 5,000 feet of pine in 10 years mm -hmm. up here in this area, particular right. area. We just don't have much. So pine is a special order for, for the railroads. Uh, railroads is just, just pretty, almost strictly oak. Okay. Um, you've talked, you've touched on this uh, a bit, but I want to get a little deeper into this. Obviously, business and prices are driven by demand. So first of all, what is the demand for timber now? And are, are you paying more or less for harvested trees now than in previous years? Probably overall uh, more. Um, we haven't really, even with our price cuts since the, you know, since December, January, our price we pay for timber hasn't changed much. Okay. It, we may have pulled back just a tiny bit but overall, it's good. Uh, oak, one thing over the years, and, and I've been in this since a kid, is oak prices don't change a lot. They're more consistent on the timber side. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, they don't make big swings. They don't go way up and they don't go way down. It, it you know, just trickles up a little bit. That's uh, walnut and white oak on the stave side has those swings. Mm -hmm. Walnut is great one one day, and next week it ain't you can't give it away. Mm -hmm. So I mean it it's like a roller coaster. It's really um, it's it's really hard to predict. It's like buying stock market shares. Mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> it changes that quick. Uh, the the hardwood side, the reason why it stays steady is because of the railroads. Railroads just maintain a you know pretty steady you know, uh, uh, production, you know, on replacing ties or all It's not that they're building all these new tracks, or, but they're constantly replacing and upgrading uh, pallets. Everything is shipped on pallets. So that, that has a consistency to it. You know, it's not a, a big, wide swinging, you know, side. The, the flooring in the cabinet grade has been fairly steady. That does have its little ups and downs, but most of that is because world markets, you know, because mm -hmm. I'll say most of the export. When, when uh, the whole world is doing good, that flooring is great. We, we, a lot of, you know, there's quite a bit stays in the U.S. too, but, uh, you know, if it was just here, it, it, it would be terrible. Mm -hmm. uh, but if you go to Home Depot, Lowe's, or any of the hardwood flooring places right now, their price hasn't went down since they've cut our price. The retail price is the same as it's always been. Mm -hmm. uh, it's just right now it's uh, oversupply. Okay. You know, uh, warehouses are full, mm -hmm. and so they're having to discount it wholesale to sell to those places um, because they have so much of it, and they've got to keep room in the warehouses to take our green lumber. So uh, it's, it's a supply and demand on that side, but sure. that's probably the... The market that fluctuates the most is the the lumber side. And your your exports, uh, where are you exporting, and what are you exporting? Well, we don't ourselves don't right. export, but uh, uh, we sell all of our lumber goes to McLean Forest Products, which is headquarters out of West Plains, Missouri. Okay. Uh, but they have a partnership with Vermillions in Springfield, so all of our flooring lumber goes to Vermillions in Springfield. Uh, and then they ship it from there wherever, you know, they have orders. But they sail, uh, uh, you know, Europe, 
you know, is is a big big part of that. And okay. uh, and we was they were shipping. I guess a lot of it was going to China and some of it to Vietnam and mm -hmm. a lot of those Asian countries also. Mm -hmm. But uh, with with COVID, that put a stop to that. Even if we had a great deal, they couldn't get it unloaded. They couldn't get it on containers if they got it to the coast to put on the ships. It was just setting. So that just kind of stopped everything, you know, and backed up. And, and we'll probably see, I think, things I'm trying to stay optimistic. But uh, uh, probably around the first of the year, we'll start to see a little more smooth uh, markets. I think things will start to smooth out. Mm -hmm. Uh, the railroad ties, is the, uh, the, do those primarily stay in the U.S. or do they go abroad as well? Just, just probably, I'd say 90, 95% stay in the U.S. Okay. Uh, every now and then they'll have orders that will go to Canada and some to Mexico. But uh, I'd say for the most part it, they stay in the U.S. But. I know in the past pressure from Canada has, has had a big impact on uh, timber sales. Is that still the case or is that... No well, th that's been an issue, but only on the uh, uh, building lumber side, the two befores on the softwood mm -hmm. side. Uh, they're not a big, uh, Canada is not a lot, doesn't have a lot of hardwood okay. like that competes with our hardwood. Okay. Now, they have some hardwood, but it's not the same. Mm -hmm. uh, theirs is mostly on the two before, two to six, the building material, that fur and that studs and things are made out of, which they're competing mostly with the South, where they have the, the same market in the South, that uh, those big chip and saw sawmills that yeah. make all that, and the OSB plants. And so that's, the, the hardwood has not really been a big issue. It's with those us. Georgia pines. Right. <laughs> that's exactly right. Uh, the plywood and that, yeah, that sure. kind of stuff like yeah. that. So that's not been a big issue for us on that side. Do uh, do all your trees come from Missouri? Or? Yes, we we there's probably maybe five percent we get a little from northern Arkansas. Okay, just you know we're sixty sixty five miles from the Arkansas line okay. from Cassville, and so occasionally we'll get some from Arkansas, but I, I not very much. And the demand for your products um, now compared to the past, I mean. Is it, you feel like it's going to be better in January, but the swing has not been that great right. for the demand of your product. Right, it's, right. It's still. Yeah, I, the demand for our product has probably it, it been affected more by COVID than the markets mm -hmm. because of the, the that supply line. But uh, overall, we've, you know, over, we've been selling this to uh, McLean's for probably almost nine or ten years now mm -hmm. here, and they've bought everything we can cut. So yeah. uh, now every now and then, you'll, these little soft spots in the economy, they'll put us on quota, you know, and say, you know, slow us down just a little bit, mm -hmm. um, like they did when with COVID. But overall, it's been just pretty well, you know, they know our volume, and so we've been selling to them so long that we kind of have that spot and, and they'll give us as much as they can stand and then, you know, maybe have to cut us back just a little bit. Mm -hmm. But, uh, so it, we were really fortunate in that. So. Sounds like, it. um, thinking beyond what we've, what we've already talked about, if, if there are any, what, what are the biggest impacts on your business, positive and negative? Uh, uh help, uh, Labor? Labor is a big deal. I, I'm really fortunate to have two sons and two nephews, and 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 the other uh, uh, four guys I've got hired are, um, we've, we've got probably the one that's been here the shortest amount of time has been here for over a year. So that's pretty good, you know, for, for our industry. Uh, a lot of when we go to the MFBA meetings and different things, the biggest complaint is help. And people are just constantly having to hire daily just to keep enough to work. Not that they're trying to add. You know, uh, uh, Don McGinnis with McGinnis Wood Products told me that he, he asked to hire, I think it, it was like seven, five to seven a day just to keep a full crew. Mm -hmm. 
So, and that, it's not because they're wanting extras, they're just enough to stay even, you know, that, but they're employing 100 to 150 people. So, you know, the bigger you are right now trying to find labor. And then on the, another thing we're seeing, and I've seen this develop a lot over the last probably, you know, five to eight years especially, is uh, loggers. That is really, that is almost, uh, you know, the way we, we grew up in it. We were taught as kids. So when we went logging, when we started our own, we didn't have to be trained. We were already kind of knew what was going on and what the sawmills were looking for and what you could cut, what you couldn't cut. Right. And now we just don't have, we don't have that workforce coming. If they're not raised in it, you, you know, if we hire somebody off the street, it's six months before they're able to even make their own wage. And that's just not, to, and it's so dangerous. Yeah, so, so the unemployment rate is not the issue because there's plenty of people who need work. It's yep. just skilled labor. Yep, that's exactly right. The skilled labor part of it. The one thing that we've, we've been, we're pretty heavily involved in the Missouri Forest Products Association. And so one thing that they've done, and we've, we've had deep discussions over this over the last two or three years, and they've developed a school for logging for, to try to bring in some young people in and uh, they, they've been struggling to get it started and get it going. Mm -hmm. They had one session uh, where they had five students, and, and it went pretty good, went pretty smooth. And then they, the next year they didn't have enough sign up, so they couldn't start it, so they postponed it. Well, this year the COVID hit, and they had a few. But what they done this year was, uh, and we took one of the students, uh, an apprentice or internship where we took one of the students and he's working with their logging crew for six weeks. He's in forestry school uh, at the University of uh, Missouri at Columbia, I guess that's, uh, but uh, so he's doing an internship for six weeks with us. Actually, this is his last week, but uh, he comes out and works with them and they, he takes the, the PTH professional timber harvesting training class and then they send him out here and then we show him what really consists of, what it's really like to be a logger, not what the, you know, the textbook tells you. Right, right, yeah. <laughs> and so he's, uh, I, I, he's a good kid, and he's really done e excellent. Uh, mm -hmm. He says he really learned a lot, and it wasn't anything what he expected it to be. But uh, he understands a little more about what it, what it means to go out and say, this tree needs to be cut and this tree don't. Mm -hmm. And you cut this one and you got you look at it, cut it down, and it looks different after you've cut it down. And then I said, and then you need to mark it, bring it in and let us saw it, and you'll see something different also. Mm -hmm. What you thought, and he's, you know, if he's going to be a forester and have to be one of those guys that goes out and marks timber, yeah, he needs to know in his mind what, what he's looking at inside that tree, not what's on the outside, sure. but also... To, to be fair to the landowner and the logging company because we, we have that every now and then, of, you know, and, and we, we talk a lot and try to have good relationship with all the foresters. But, you know, you mark timber coming, you know, and if we cut it and it, st it starts running bad, then I call the forester and I say, can you come out? So we need to, you know, discuss this. Not that I'm complaining, but I think it's something you ought to know and how, you, how did you figure this? These trees are... Are, are running bad mm -hmm. and you know you calculated them to all be good and I paid for them you know to be good you know and so you know we of course that's just because a forester goes and marks the timber and sets up the sale we still spend a lot of time looking at it sure. before we buy it we don't just take that and they'll tell you you need to go look for yourself because uh, and, and my my uncle he he told me this and I never forgot it he said, when you're looking to buy timber, he said, you should always look at it three times. He said, you'll see something different every time you look at it. Mm -hmm. Just, he said, you need to look at it three times. Yeah, go look at it one day, wait a few days, go back and look at it again, and then look at it again, but right before you bid, go always go the day before you're going to bid or look at it, you need to look at it again. 
God's good life advice. Yeah, it, it is. So he, said, <laughs> he said you'll lose a lot less money if you look at them at least yeah. three times. So. Yeah, that applies to more than just two. Yeah, right? That's right. <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, so um, what about um, disease, um, beetles, any, any of that kind of – is that – an issue in this part of the country. It has been, yes. Uh, we see a lot of that, uh, uh, this oak decline, and uh, we're um, trees that are just, you know, you you can, you know, if you, when we get done here, if you want to, we'll go down, we'll watch some saw, and you'll, when you take them slabs off of them, and you see those worm holes, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, it's, it's usually in them little older age trees that, uh, you know, this guy was hanging on to was going to be these, you know, prime trees, yeah. and you cut them down and saw them, and they're full of worms and and you know and stuff. It uh, that we, it's, it seems like that's we we've been seeing that more and more in the last years, and I don't know if the we've had some of these drought years, you mm -hmm. know, where um, and that's when you see it happen. It's not not that year, but a few years down the road because they got in it, it they. You know, it the drought affected them, but then it takes a few years. Then the bugs start; they get weak in their immune system, just like our body. You know, they get the bugs tend to get in them, and they get uh, they'll start in the decline. Then, so that's yeah. oak decline. I've, yeah. heard, I've heard that term before. Yeah. And I didn't know yeah. if it was actually a disease or if it was uh, insects or yeah, or it's it's disease, and then they've had some bug problems also mm -hmm. in the oak. Uh, which has affected the white oak probably more than the red. Um, but uh, we've had a little bit of trouble with that. The, the ash borer has been a problem probably going on 10 years now, but it, mm -hmm. and it's spread from, supposedly spread from the northeast, mm -hmm. you know, and slowly came this way. Um, they've tried quarantines, you know, and, and certain counties at one time were quarantined where you couldn't take ash tree, Anything with bark, ash bark on it, couldn't be le couldn't leave the county until it was treated, but uh, they only controlled it for a short amount of time. It uh, now it's statewide, you know, but it's uh, uh, still right now it's not an ash board or anything ash that's that's not a hundred percent bark free is supposed to be heat treated or fumigated before it leaves the state. Mm. So. That's the, and it supposedly came from firewood, being campers, yep. vacationers bringing their own firewood in, and it gets in and bores in the wood, and just it'll just bore plumb through to the heart of it, just mm -hmm. leave holes in it. And, uh, so. Yeah, I was wondering if, if any species in this part of the country had suffered uh, catastrophic loss, like hemlocks in, in some areas mm -hmm. or whatever. Um, yeah, so far no. That's uh, good. You know, they, they've uh, the conservation department has been really active that trying to catch it before it gets gets away. And they're they've got bug traps up out here on this one of my trees out out here. And then they've had some on the walnut. I've got a walnut down there by the mill that mm -hmm. they come out and hang some bug traps mm -hmm. in. And so far, they've not found any in this area in this country, but uh, there's some some bugs that are uh, hitting the walnuts pretty hard in some areas, mm -hmm. and and so they're they're watching it pretty close. I, I'm not sure they're going what they're going to do if they find them, yeah. other than know they're here, yeah. you know. But uh, they're working hard at it to try to keep it under control the best you can. So I think it's part of the life cycle. We have some of that where you know you go through a spell and you. You know, the bugs will eat it up, and then it all comes back and stronger and better. Uh -huh. Forest products make up uh, about 10% of the agricultural economy in Missouri, I think. Do you think the industry is overall is healthy right now? I think so. Um, I, I've, I've heard of some mills shutting down. Uh, I've not heard of a lot of them just going out and ha and just dissolving because of it uh, some of the, the the industry as a whole is is a pretty conservative bunch on their finances so they when when things get a little bit bad a lot of them will just shut down and kind of go to do other things mm -hmm. until 
things straightened out, and, and I've heard of a few of them just saying, you know, we're just going to shut down for a month or two, and, you know, I've got, you know, they'll say, well, i got cows and some other stuff I need to be doing anyway. I'm just going to shut down for a little while and let, let, let things recover. Uh, overall, I think it's good. You know, and, and I think the numbers out last year was, you know, we added $9 billion to the state economy, you know, just, just in the Hardwood Association through, the, through everything. It's, it's, uh, it's quite a deal over the whole state, you know, when you get to looking around. So. Uh, do you know how the timber industry in Missouri compares to other parts of the country? Uh, no, not really. Uh, you know, I know this area is not doesn't count on it as much as the southeast mm -hmm. area over there it's uh, that's just pretty well what everybody yeah. it's neither that person is working in it or they're working in something that pertains to it sure. uh, over from mountain view all the way to popper bluff over in that country it's mm -hmm. um, you're you're in it or something is connected to it mm -hmm. grocery stores connected to the sawmills and loggers and and uh, you know parts stores, and yeah. so you know it, it, whatever you're doing, you're connected somehow to it. So um, we we've, we've got a loggers and sawmills. The loggers probably more than sawmills over all oh, probably the last decade. I guess they've kind of got a bad rap. Of you, you there's no uh, license or. Uh, uh, curriculum that you have to do to become a logger oh. you just buy a chainsaw and kind of you get in it and so there's crooks out there oh. and so just like with everything else that one one guy gets cheated all loggers are crooks so uh, you know so you get a bad rap on that and so w we do our best to try to uh tell loggers or and 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 have nothing to do with loggers that we think are crooks mm -hmm. and not even by their logs because right. it, all it's going to do is bring us into a mess so yeah. if we suspect that anything's going on we just turn them away sure. we it's just not worth the the the, the mess you know sure. because we we get landowners calling and and i think uh, landowners could do a better job of educating themselves before they call somebody to come and look at their timber and not always take the first offer. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the saying that I know you've heard it a thousand. I was told this as a kid. If it's too good to be true, it usually is, you yeah. know. And, you know, if, if they come in there and offer you this crazy price, it, it's something's up. You know, yeah. you need to be asking questions. You need to be calling. And 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 we don't care if, uh, you know, we, we buy probably – at least 60% of the logs we saw, we, we log 50% or 60% and, and buy about that same, same amount. And if landowner calls us and says, hey, so-and-so is out here looking at my timber, could you give them, you know, are they any good? Are they crooks? Or do you know anything about them? Or, you know, and we're glad to tell them, you know, I mean, yeah, they're they they'll do exactly what they say, or boy, you better run them off there as quick as you can, you know, and because they have a bad reputation, you know, uh, and and uh, we we get those calls, uh, you know, people that'll call and and we had nothing to do with it, wasn't anywhere around it, don't even know the guys that cut it, but they want us to come out and look and say, boy, we just feel like we got cheated. Mm -hmm. said, it's already cut and gone. Yeah. There's nothing I can do. tell you. I, I can't. I can't tell you whether they did or didn't. You sh you know, you need to be, you know, I, I, I always make this reference to my boys the same way. If a farmer that has cows and I walked up to him and he didn't know me from nobody and I told him I was going to give him $5,000 a head for his cows, but I'm going to haul them off and sell them and then I'll bring you a check back. <laughs> you know, would do, would, they wouldn't let me do that. Sure. They're smarter than that, but sometimes we get people that let, they trust in this day and time, and that's bad, I hate to say that, but you, you've got to verify, even if you think the person's, you know, looks is on the up and up, sure. because you'll, that's the first time you'll get skint. And, yeah. and, there's a, and that's a lot of money. You know, a you know, track of timber, depending on, you know, anywhere, 40 acres could be, you know, $15,000, $20,000. Sure. 
And when it's gone, it's gone. Mm-hmm. You're, you can sue them and take them to court, but what are you going to get? Yeah. A bad judgment that you can't collect on. Mm-hmm. And so you, you need to know. You have to be on the front side. Right, you right. And so side. we do, you know, probably 75% of all of our timber is bought with payment up front. Before the first tree's cut, we pay for it. And so they know they're getting their money. You know, the check is good when it's wrote. And uh, occasionally we'll have, you know, people that want a little different prescription and it's hard to, without going through and marking an individual tree, you know, every every one, that we'll, uh, you know, we'll do it on a pay us cut. But I I always invite them. First thing is, you know, if we're going to be, you know, in business here together and I'm going to be buying your timber, Come and visit the mill. Mm-hmm. Come and visit. I'm going to show you that I can't just load my stuff up and be gone tomorrow. Yeah. You know, I'm. You're, you, you see where I'm at. I can't leave here. I'm here. Mm-hmm. So you know where I'm at if something happens. You, you can come after me. But um, Well, and that means that you've got to be pretty knowledgeable when you go out onto a track of land looking at those trees, knowing whether or not they're good trees, if yeah. they're worth the money, yeah. before you ever saw into the bar. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, and that's it, that's with experience, yeah. you know, and, and that's something that uh, this intern, you know, I was trying to, you know, give him a little advice on that, that it it don't just, you don't just learn that mm-hmm. here. You are you need to see it all the way through, sure. and the the best way to, to figure that out is to spend your own money. Mm-hmm. You'll find out real fast whether <laughs> what you're looking at. <laughs> um. What have been the biggest changes in the timber industry in your lifetime, especially the impact of technology on that? Uh, probably the automated machines. Talk about that a little bit. Uh, we're, when, when I was growing up, every, you know, we turned the logs by hand in the sawmill with a can hook, rolled them over, and, you know, you just it was just muscle. You know, you had to lift and turn them and, raised a dog up and down with your hand and locked it on the carriage and pulled the belt feed that you pulled it and that the belt made it go forward and you pushed it and made it go backwards and and now everything's hydraulics and you know the the cab I've got down there them especially them younger boys it's video games to them yeah. you know it's a computer screen up there that tells them what they're cutting and they're operating little short joysticks like this Op- t- turns the log here turns makes the carriage go back and forth hit a button and it sets the log you know before we had a ratchet you know you had to pull like this every lumber you had to pull that thing you had to pull that log out to get to you that uh the you know and the, the resaw is the same way the guys are sitting in air-conditioned cabs you know they're not getting dirty and dusty they're they can listen to the radio while they're you know while they're uh, sawing and uh we are are Everything that comes out in the back is on a green chain. The only thing that the, the guys that in the back have to handle is lumber. They don't have to lift a tie. They don't have to lift a four by six. Goes down a green chain into a slide and a forklift picks them up and takes them over. And then there's another automated cab that the guy sends the ties down and grades and then trims them. And he's sitting in a cab pushing buttons too with air conditioning. I mean, that's all huge. You know, we... Uh, we stacked slabs by hand, throwed them off in a crate, and had to keep them straight. And when the sawyer stopped to sharpen the saw, we went back and barked and stacked ties and throwed them by hand. Had to throw them in bundles, and yeah. and that's why I got half fingers or fingers mashed. And <laughs> well, that's a good point. That's going to be my next question: is that so? The technology has made it safer. Absolutely, and I'd so say that's good. A hundred percent safer than yeah. it used to be. Yeah. Them, the old carriages with the belt feed, they called it a friction feed. You, you can't get the carriage to hold still. It won't stop. You ha- you know, you're sitting there doing this to get it to stay in one spot while you're trying to roll the log and get it set. And now that hydraulics, you know, it goes back and it just stops and it'll sit there until you touch something. It ain't going nowhere. And so that was that's a big deal. There's been so many people, arms cut off, hands cut off, you know, uh, you know, get in front of that carry, you know, over to bend over to pick something and the carriage takes off because that belt caught, knocks them into the saw or knocks them down. And, 
you know, this, these old guys were just, you just can't imagine how tough some of them guys were. Yeah. And, uh, you know, to do that. And, and, the, and the logging the same way, you know, uh, cutting them trees down with a crosscut saw and limbing them with an ax. And, <laughs> and I, I tell my boys, I, I probably got more whippings over using my grandpa's ax than I did anything. Because he kept it razor sharp. Yeah. And if you took that axe out and dulled it, he was mad. You know, so. it had to, that was his tool to work with. And sure. So, uh, well, forest growth is actually outpacing harvesting in Missouri right now, I think, um, from what I've read. Uh, what can you tell us about how your industry in general and your business specifically handles issues of sustainability and uh, the environment and that yeah. sort of thing? Well, sure the, that's more of a well now. Uh, as of last year, the numbers I heard uh, got through the MFPA, through the uh, Conservation Department, we were growing two times more than we're cutting. Right, right. So, uh, I, and I think that's awesome. I mean, and I think it's due to uh, force management from the Conservation Department and and some of the other things that are, that are out there. Um, uh, with these uh, private consultants, you know, and mm -hmm. they've got this uh, call before you cut, yep. you know, program. Where, you know, what is the call before you cut? Uh, well, it's, uh, it's through the conservation, but if you call in, they will refer you to a certified forester to come out and look at your uh -huh. timber and give you an idea before you cut or have a sale. Mm -hmm. You know, they're, you're not obligated to anything. They'll just come out and give you an assessment on what they think you are to do, whether you should go ahead and let them implement a program or, or no, you shouldn't cut your timber or, or yeah, you should cut it, you know. And uh, so uh, a lot of people don't know that's out there. And that's a free, it's free. It doesn't cost anything. Oh, really? Yeah, it, you just call them. And, and I think the uh, conservation department uh, has kicked in some money and they will actually pay that forester so much to go and do that assessment, but they're paying it, not you. Yeah, yeah. And so that's a pretty active department. It is. It is. They're 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 really. I know people make them out to be villains, but they're they're not. They're out there to try to really help and and to help our industry as a whole. You know? I think they do a lot of educational. Uh, they, a lot. Programming too. They yeah. they're a lot. They're they're heavily into the the PTH classes with the professional timber harvesting thing. Um, to get people uh, where well, you're not just getting so many injuries and just people out there that just grab a chainsaw at Lowe's and go mm -hmm. out and think they can cut timber and, yeah. and you're hearing about them getting a tree on them, getting killed or getting, you know, broke up and busted yeah. up and uh, wearing the PPE and, and the chaps and the hard hats. And, mm -hmm. and uh, I wished I would have started a long time ago. I was fortunate that I never got my head completely busted open i've been hitting the head a time or two and had sure. to have you know band-aids and stitches and uh, but uh, the reason i'm hard hearing now is because i didn't wear earplugs mm -hmm. till i was 30 years old yeah and and uh, now i i won't start a chainsaw without putting earplugs in my ears and i don't i don't even like to hang around that sawmill so if i get up there around that saw used to when you're outside doing that manual mill I, I'd, all night I'd hear bees in my ears. Yeah. You just hear that constant, constant singing yeah. of, of in your ears all night. You get used to it over years, and you don't think anything about it, and all of a sudden you're asking, what, huh, uh -huh. all the time because yeah. you can't hear. Yeah. Um, have uh, state and local um, policies, government policies, had any impact on your business or on the, on the industry? Uh, positive or negative? You know, I can't say that anything negative. Uh -huh. um, you know, that's that's really hurt us. Uh, a few, there's a few little things that uh, we have to get used to. Uh, you know, uh, I know I resisted a lot uh, 15, 20 years ago in these uh, these uh, uh, BMP zones, which is mm -hmm. uh, you know, the, in these uh, SMZ streamside yeah. management zones, but uh, you know, after you study it and kind of go to some of the classes and you kind of forced to go, you know, if you're going to do conservation sales, they, you have to attend those. And you start to understand it's, 
once you kind of understand it and do it, it's not as big a problem as you thought it was going to be. Okay. You thought it was going to take all this time out of your day and going to take you weeks to implement these things. But we've just got used to it now, and, and when we we finish a section in a certain area of timber and we know we're going to have to put uh, water bars in or something like that, we just do it right then. Mm -hmm. Usually don't take more than 45 minutes to do it, and we're on to the next section and we're starting a new place and when the job's done we're done we're moving on to the next job whereas i've seen guys wait till the very end and then they'll have to spend a day and a half going back over the whole track to try to fix their problems uh, yeah you know and they just don't understand if you'll just do them right then and that it's uh, so that that's kind of but but I, i'm not, that's not negative mm -hmm. that's probably a positive overall yeah because you're just trying to stop that heavy rain till the uh, growth comes back. Once the growth comes back, it takes care of itself, you know, so that don't have to last forever. You're just needing it till the get some cover on the ground and get a little grass or weeds or something growing there so it slows that water in it. So in the long term, you think these conservation measures have been helpful? Absolutely. I think so, yeah, yeah. Uh, some of them, I, you know, I'm sure I could probably find one or two that I wouldn't agree <laughs> with, but but overall, I'd say yeah, and I'd say that you could probably find some people with the conservation that don't always agree with some of the things mm -hmm. that gets implemented. But sure. you know, nitpicky stuff probably. But uh, I think overall, it's 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 the best thing for us. How would you say the people of Missouri have benefited most from the timber industry? Uh, I know in this area. Economics has probably been one of the biggest things. Uh, just here in this local area, you know, we we probably overall, by the time it's all said and done, we probably put $2 million back into the economy just right here. You know, and what we, we pay the landowners and what we pay the loggers. And then our help at the mill are guys we buy parts and tires from mechanics sure. and you know, we see the checks going here and going there to out. And uh, so, you know, all that's put right back here local. And, uh, you know, a farmer gets up against it needing to buy a few more cows. And when bad times or something, he's got a little patch of timber he can sell. He can sell the timber and buy his cows for when they go up or feed his cows, you know. Yeah. And so there's there's some, I think that's probably the best thing and uh, uh, overall. Based on, on, on your knowledge of, of the industry, is there a bright future for for timber in, in Missouri? I would like to think so. I, I'm, I, my my biggest concern is the younger generation and the logging side. Everybody is in the industry. You can go anywhere, even over on the southeast side, and they're all everybody's looking for help in the woods. It's a uh, it's something that's just, I don't, you know, they're not bringing their, uh, even loggers will tell you they try to keep their kids out of it mm -hmm. anymore. Uh, they get, it's a rough living. Mm -hmm. It's dangerous. Mm -hmm. um, enjoy it. I think it's one of the most honest livings you can do. You you know, whatever you make, you earn it. You know, you you, you make your own job, and, and you, you need to work. If you work hard, you're going to make money. If you don't, you ain't going to make any. You know, I mean, it's it's just one of them things. So, safety is is a big issue. Insurance, trying to keep insurance. We we pay astronomical fees on insurance on our logging crews and our sure. sawmill. We have to have it. Mm -hmm. But there might even be some profit in it if it wasn't for all the insurance that we have to have. Uh, but we have to have it, and so I think it's uh, it's growing more and more in this area. It's a little more dominant over on the east side now, but all the mechanized logging with the tree cutters and the delimmers, you know, stuff, they're trying to get people off the ground mm -hmm. with a chainsaw in their hand. Mm -hmm. You're always going to have to have some of that because yep. there's certain things you can't do with that machinery. But 60% of the danger is cutting the tree down. And if you can take a you know, a new tree cutter, a, a four-wheel cutter is going to probably cost you two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Mm -hmm. But over time, it's going to pay for itself in production and lost 
revenue from your guy being hurt. Yeah. You know, if he gets hurt, gets his leg cut, he's off for six weeks, what are you going to do now? Yeah. You know, because it ain't like you got him standing in line to step into his spot, you know, and, and then you got to take care of him, you know, and he's still got to be paid. So yeah. um, I think it's going more and more to that. And we've, me and my brothers have seriously considered it right now. The, of getting a cutter, just a, a tree cutter, just mm -hmm. to, you know, to do that with. Just haven't done it yet. But just because that skilled labor is such, it's, a, such it's, an issue. Yeah, and you can put a guy in that cab. Now, he's still got to be pretty skilled. Mm -hmm. And even in that machine, he's got to know what he's doing. Sure. Um, but he's, he's so much safer in that cab. He's in that cab. He's in an air-conditioned cab again. And he's cutting that tree and placing that tree where he wants it. You know, he can lay it down so it's not as dangerous as, you know, if you're cutting a tree down, you've got a, a window that you can fall that tree in. Mm -hmm. That's all you're going to, it's going to allow you to do. Certain tricks you can do with a wedge and make it go here or there or yonder according to the little lean of the tree. But with that tree cutter, now you've got almost a 360 degree. You can throw it here, 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 here. Mm -hmm. I mean, you've got all these places that you can lay that tree down safely to where the guy can get out and trim it up safely. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so there's a, a big advantage to that. And, uh, and the insurance goes down. Your work comp insurance, sure. you know, gets cut by a third if you can keep get that guy off the ground, yeah. you know, get a chainsaw out of his hand. So uh, there's, there's a big advantage of it. I, I think that's going to be the way um, 10 years from now there will be very few guys still doing it on the on the ground, mm -hmm. they'll they'll still be the little small guy that, you know, is a part time logger. You know that will do it. You right. know with chainsaw, but but uh, it's just it's just getting to where you can't afford to do it. You know, mm -hmm. uh, it's just it's so dangerous and 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 no skilled labor. Mm -hmm. You know to to do it. Is there anything we need to cover? Anything else you want to know? I, I hope I haven't been long-winded no, to you. No, this has been very, very helpful. <laughs> I, hope, I hope you've enjoyed it as much as I have. I have. I have. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you.